Okay, first of all, like uh, a little bit administrative stuff. I guess I'll just get started. So um, some of you guys are, are graduate students. I, I, I can recognize some of you guys. Like one, two, three, and the rest, probably not, probably not. Oh, I guess he seems to be, I forgot, yeah. Um, and um, so uh, I'll just do a quick log to it here. To be fair, like to just show it's fair and balanced or whatever that uh, I didn't can't make it up the schedule. So, um, so I guess this is the names of your you guys say for the graduate students. So uh, I guess I for you to be like the taking the graduate credits. As I remember, as I mentioned a couple of times, that uh, you have to have a presentation, and uh, maybe like twenty thirty minutes. So and uh, it's supposed to be something recent, not too old. But unlike your project, you can just talk about that. I mean, I mean, you don't need to actually do something about it. As long as hopefully you understand something about it, then you can explain that. And tentative schedule. If no one has any problem with that, like. Will be like from March. We were just consecutive two weeks for the presentations, and like um, March fifth to March fourteen, and then like if you guys have no objection he, here, also for the normal folks here, the toaster guy will will be last and will be after spring break, so he's the poor guy, right? One poor guy far away, so so uh, give him a little bit benefit on that part. So um. And uh, so I'll just get started. So just make sure your names are correct, I guess. Like, so uh, already shuffle. Uh, a very simple command, like, yes? What is that for again? The shuffle? Yeah. Oh, shuffle, just shuffle the names. So uh, I have the names here, right? It will shuffle the order now. Okay, is that for undergrads? Or not oh, no, no, only, only graduates. These oh. names are the graduate guys. Okay. Yeah, they, they're supposed to give presentations uh, like on these days. So uh, here's your schedule. I guess uh, first is uh, Sylvia, and she's not here also. So, but um, this will be the schedule, and I I will post that also. So, um, and uh, and uh, let me just keep a copy like this also. So okay, let's get to the main business. So we're going to talk about. Um, I will digress a little bit from the uh, low-level uh, image processing slash computer vision um, to camera model. So um, it's a weird place to talk about this. I don't know how to kind of classify uh, this into which category, but like I, I, I guess we at least we talk about some of these camera models and so on. And um, so um, actually, I, I think it should be the first lecture to talk about that. But um, anyway, we didn't. But now we're going to talk about that. So of course, all of you guys know what's camera. But I'm not sure you really know what is camera. Because what do you think what is camera, really? Why is it called camera, even? I'm sure you don't know about that if you didn't look at the notes or you didn't have history lesson or whatever. What what's camera stand for, really? What was the original word of camera? Um, so it turns out camera is actually mean worm in Italy, Italian. So it's really, it used to be a huge worm. Uh, so it's like an example of camera like that. So I have a projection. And it's really old te technology because like, it, it dated back like in ancient Greece and China. They, they described like uh, you just have put a pinhole there, you can project light. And then on the other side, you can see actually an image there. So have the pinhole camera. And you have used for actually in 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 sixteenth century, does it kind of I have fourteenth century. I, I, I always don't know like fifteen something it should be sixteen or seventeenth century. It's been seventeenth century, sixteenth uh, century. Right? So um, so they they have technique like that, and people claim like why the artists like just be, become like infinitely better in this era is because like they have this a. Like, Cheating machine basically, so uh, can get the uh, basic perspective white. Um, and this is the first photograph. Like, um, 
expand the apps and uh, still have that photo uh, available like in UT Austin and uh, it took long time to dispose of, like eight hours and uh, that story that I, I don't know whether I should uh, but there's link there you can go back to look at that but maybe I'll just play a little bit it's very interesting actually if you look at some of the history oh okay I'm not sh sure I need to first A sec. So this is a very nice site, like talking about the uh, history. And that's how I know how to pronounce the apps because I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, actually, really. Uh, I guess uh, I forgot how to pronounce this one also. Um, but anyway, like he first uh, kind of invented the photograph and he collaborated with this, the, the girl or like, something like that. And uh, he um, kind of, this guy is kind of like a showsman and like he kind of refined that a little bit and kind of like make it popular. So but anyway, let, let's, um, let's just go back to the slides. Oh, okay, why, why is here? So yes. And um, so of course it's not much of a concern about history, but more or less like we, we want to really know the math and like maybe some of the physics there so um, of course, uh, you know, we, when we have cameras and images and so on, like we're projecting 3D worlds to like 2D images, right? And um, yeah, this is just a fun photo. And sorry, a digression here again. So and, and like it is, this actually, by the way, like also like illustrate the difficulty there, right? So um, you can have like very different 3D scenes that just have the same kind of like 2D results right so I mean um, so uh, um, okay yeah, yeah this is another like uh, kind of interesting just want to mention that it's by Harbin Harbin I think it's called um, and um, can, can you visualize this guy this thing Let, let's try like if I use pointer here so do you know what is this can you see this this thing here. Uh, actually, this is like another like kind of like cool video. Uh, this is the best thing. I mean, really, I don't know why kind of like PowerPoint is so primitive in this sense. I like, need to keep <laughs> changing the pointer back and forth. Uh, this is something from Khan Academy and uh, hmm. We need to get back. England, and on the right, George de Selve, his friend, a bishop, and also an ambassador. Both of these men are in England, and Holbein, who was a Swiss painter, had moved to England because he could get work here. And in fact, within a short time after making this painting, he would actually become the painter to the King of England, Henry VIII. King Henry VIII is about to break away from the Pope in Rome, from the Catholic Church, and we know that the French ambassador was in England to keep an eye on Henry VIII during this tumultuous period. And we see within the painting references to the turmoil that is taking place in England, but it's all within an even greater context. So let's start with the two men. We see Jean de Dondeville on the left, and he's the one who commissioned this painting, and he's the one whose house the painting hung in. 
And he's obviously represented as an enormously wealthy and successful man with this fur-lined cloak and velvet and satin clothing. And he holds a dagger. He holds a dagger on which is inscribed his age, which was 29. So he's a very young man. And Holbein really described his clothing with a sense of clarity and detail that we expect of that northern tradition that Holbein comes from. And then on the right, Georges de Selve is dressed more modestly in a fur cloak. And he's got his elbow on a book. And it really is an interesting kind of contrast. We have that dagger on the one side and the book on the other. References which are actually quite traditional to the active versus the contemplative life. And George de Selves, the book that he's got his elbow on, has inscribed on it his age, which is 25. Of course, we're meant to look at both of them, but even more than that, perhaps, we're meant to look at what's in the middle of the painting, which is all these objects on these two levels of shelves. Holbein is just brilliant in his ability to render textures and the material reality of those objects. And of course, they also mean something. On the top shelf, we have objects that are related to the heavens, to the study of astronomy, and to the measuring of time. And on the lower shelf, things that are more earthly. We have a terrestrial globe, and a lute, and a book about arithmetic, and a book of hymns. The painting is functioning basically as a grid. On the left, you have the active life. On the right, you have the contemplative life. At the top, you've got the celestial sphere. At the bottom, the terrestrial sphere. Look at the beautifully foreshortened lute on the bottom shelf. The lutes were traditionally objects that were rendered in order to learn perspective. And here, there's just this masterful representation of the way in which that lute is much shorter than it should be because we're seeing it on end. But if you look very closely, and it's possible because of Holbein's high-pitched clarity, you can see that one of the strings is actually snapped. It's broken. Art historians understand this as referring to the discord in Europe at this time, the discord in the church. That can also be seen in the hymn book, which is just below that. It's open, and it's so precisely painted that it can actually be read. It's a translation of a hymn by Martin Luther, of course, the head of the Protestant Reformation. So all of this luxury, we haven't even mentioned, for instance, the Oriental carpet, all of these objects, all the extraordinary fashion that they wear, all of this stands on a mosaic floor with this beautifully detailed tiling, and it's seen in perfect linear perspective. And this is a reference to an actual floor at Westminster Abbey. And what's important to know is that that floor in that church is actually a kind of diagram and it's meant to represent the macrocosm, that is, the cosmic order. If we look at the very large form that occupies the foreground. You know, I had a student once that when she looked at this said, it looked like a piece of driftwood. Can, can anyone guess now? Like, what is that? Oh, you, oh, yeah, you see in that direction. <laughs> yes, actually, you, you need to see from that side to see that it's gold. It's gold. Yeah. So, and yeah. it's somehow been placed down oddly in the foreground. It does, but when you go to the right corner of the painting, you kind of crouch down a bit. Or look at it in a mirror at an angle. What we're really looking at is an anamorphic image, a kind of image that's been artificially stretched in perspective. And it's a skull, a human skull. It's something that you can't see when you can see the other things in the painting, but it's something you can see when you don't see the other things in the painting. So you have a choice. You can either stand in such a way as to see the skull, but then everything else is distorted, or vice versa. Front and center in this painting, really, in a sense, the star of the painting, is the Yeah, skull. I guess I would just stop here. But anyway, like, it's kind of interesting. I, yeah, I, I, I knew that it was a skull, like, uh, because I, 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 this is my second time to give this lecture, but I didn't watch this video last time. I didn't know like that. There's so many kind of like hidden thing in that uh, painting there, and um, and let's see. And okay, we we'll really get into some of this math and like physics stuff. So, of course, the simplest thing, simplest model would be the, simply the pinhole camera. So the pinhole camera would be like you have. Oops, I need to again, I swap to like, uh, it's so annoying. Yeah, pinhole you know, camera is basically just you have kind of like some light coming in or like image you project in a way that uh, through this pinhole and then you put in a reasonable distance, that's basically the focal length, then you project the image there. So uh, of course it will be upside down like that, right? 
and um, we, we can kind of like do a you, you, you can also like think of geometrically assume there's a virtual image in front like same distance from this like focal length I mean this like like this distance d here we can just assume like in front of the pinhole there's a d here I have a virtual image here then we will just have like geometry like this way so then we can kind of have a very simple equation let's say where should be the the x y location like, on the image if we have the image let's say in a 3d location 3d points like x y and z uh, here the coordinates we just assume that like the origin is lie on the center of the projection there and then like so by really simple arithmetic and geometry would be just the distance uh, x pi will be just d times x over z, z and like y pi is uh, d times y over z so very simple um and uh so now one one thing like what you can see is like this thing is not actually linear not linear in the sense that you have like one over z or one over z here right at the bottom so um if if you have object like i mean in the z direction there this is not linear with respect to z there even though you're uh, linear with respect to x and y so we can fix that by introducing something called uh, I should fix that because like, we, we want stuff to be linear so what we want is like we have some coordinate like in the um, what I mean is like in, in the in the 3D domain originally like x y and z let's say somehow we can project to just the image maybe like y small x and small y image coordinate and this projection we hope to be linear let's say like it will be like some function of this x y and c right and like as you can see like of course this function is just like this simple equation here right so this is basically the function there but the catch is the function is not linear and it's not so nice so what we are going to do is like we just introduce a new coordinate system it's very simple it's basically just add an additional one to the coordinate so if we do that like the, for example like the 2d case will just extend into a third dimension will be become three dimension and um and then like as you can see like what it represents is that like uh if i have this is not equal to one let's say it's equal to w it, it will be representing equivalently the same thing as like x over w y over w and one something like that i mean these two will basically represent the same thing represent the same coordinate so then as you can see therefore like this is basically re representing representing like x over w and y over w so it's clear here right so then um then um then in that sense like the projection become linear because now let's say i have the the third dimension like three dimension coordinates also like add and one there i will simply my projection will be just like that with a simple kind of like matrix multiplication we start with this coordinate multiply by this matrix there we got this and then we convert it back to the uh, ordinary coordinate uh, euclidean coordinate and we'll just have this over c here that as we want so it's clear so that 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 is convenient once we switch from this uh, Euclidean coordinate system to this homogeneous coordinate system then many stuff like become linear so and uh, and this is long a perspective projection and this this matrix here is called the projection matrix that you will see like several times later on and we, we kind of like like this of course um you can think of it as like most uh, simple projective uh, project uh, projection matrix. You can have more complicated case like when these other coefficients are non zeros and so on. And uh, so here, just illustrate like the project projection matrix won't be. 
I mean, the basically the projection won't be won't have any change if we just change the scale of that projection matrix. So, for example, if I scale it by d, I have this, and I multiply that, I got this. But this basically represents exactly the same coordinate. And uh, and this is some example of the project uh, perspective projection. So, um, if you use basically like that, that's realistic. Like if you play three D games or like do really realistic drawing, it's all based on this perspective projection. And uh, if you, you put on all the points like, in the space, I'm trying to just compare what's the points like, in that 3D plane, or oh, sorry, the, the image plane there, that, that's exactly like that. So, uh, and if you use the perspective projection. So if you want to sim simplify the case a little bit, um, we, we can kind of um, have some fake uh, 3D uh, projection, for example, like uh, that's so-called orthographic projection. Basically, we just ignore the uh, set component. You, you remember, like earlier, if we have um, if we have like perspective projection, this will won't be zero. So uh, this is a long zero here. If we assume this to be zero, as you can see, what's going on, like for the uh, Z component of the image, or like. Uh, uh, I mean, like, or, or I, sh I should say, like, this projection, as you can see, it basically won't depend on C, uh, C component here, right? So it's like it just take advantage of the X and Y component and just project that uh, directly on the plane there. And we can have some modification for that one. For example, like, we can have non zero in this, uh, the first two rows there, but in the third row, like, all first three coefficients are zeros. So in that case, I uh, is uh, called like par perspective. So actually, it's quite um, typical. Like when we first learn how to draw, like in I don't know elementary school, like three D objects, what we're trying, what we're always drawing is all in like power perspective, as as like this. This is what you expect to draw like in power perspective, and um, and that that's basically some simple uh, projective matrix. So now get back to uh, perspective projection. So um, first question, like we want to get some properties of perspective projections. So we want to know like what, what kind of stuff is preserved after perspective projection. The first thing we realize is that like um, straight lines are preserved. So everything is straight lines in the in the 3D space after the perspective projection will still like straight lines. So for example, like you we have this real world capture real worlds. So and you, it used to be straight line, but it's still straight lines. Furthermore, like we we will have all the parallel lines will converge to the uh, vanishing points. So as you can see, uh, like this is this kind of the real world is supposed to be parallel. Right? It converge to like some vanishing points, and you can have like different parallel lines converge to different par uh, vanishing points, and th those vanishing points will kind of all lie on the vanishing lines there. It's basic, basically the horizon that we typically. This is like a drawing class, anyway. So, um, and this is some more example. If you look at the kind of like the vanishing points and the vanishing lines there, like and all the vertical lines which should just vanish at infinity, and you have the horizontal lines vanish like on the vanishing lines, um, and. Uh, and um, other properties, like um, um, pawns, of course, we project to pawns, lines project to lines, and uh, uh, line focal points. If 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 the lines on the focal points we project to to a pawn, so what what we mean is that like if oh we need to go back to uh, so uh, let's see if I can draw it. If I can even draw it, yeah, it, it makes um. So if I have, for example, this is the pinhole camera there. So this is the pinhole. If I project that, if that lines turns out to go through that pinhole, then of course, I if you project on this virtual image, you you only see a point instead of seeing a line. So that 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 just that means there. 
and planes will be still planes or like maybe half planes um, and then like okay so uh, uh, now I get two cameras like some some so we saw the projection matrix so so if you think of that like the projection matrix of the um, it's basically characterized the entire cameras right because uh, I shouldn't say that because there will be some some more like distortion and so on. But if we have a simple pinhole cameras, uh, simple pinhole camera, basically like the projective matrix will basically capture every characteristic of that camera. So you can think of like because I the projective matrix is telling you like every point in the space how it will be like put on the uh, put on your image, right? So then I, like, okay, this question may be easy, right? If I ask like how many numbers of parameters, then you know that like at least it shouldn't be more than 12, right? Because I, like, you have the projective matrix, matrix like three by four or something like that. Um, but we, we can reduce it a bit more, right? Because the like, first thing, um, we know that like scaling that projective matrix doesn't do anything. So at least the number of parameters should be less than or equal to 11, right? So. And maybe we can scale down a little bit more if we assume some um, symmetry of your photo for uh, your camera. Let's say uh, the you expect that the horizontal scaling and vertical scaling is the same. I mean, there's no, and also maybe there's no skin effect and so on that will also affect the number of parameters there. But we will get into that like each one by one. So. Um, so this is just um okay this slide I just want to say we need to be careful um that in general we can have like two coordinate systems but we probably want to merge into one so we we may start with a coordinate system say like in to describe the entire space here but the cameras can have like other coordinate systems but it's easy right we can just basically say like they may not have the same origin um also the the assets may not be aligned to each other. So then one thing we want to do maybe is first trying to um, align this origin and also like align the assets there. Um, and um, so, uh, okay, this I will go, go back later on. And when you align, oh yeah, actually I can go, go into that here. So when you align the coordinates, just uh, to tell, talk about like, what's the world coordinates and also where the uh, camera coordinates, the parameters to specify that is, uh, are the extrinsic parameters. And uh, the parameters that I mentioned that like, it will affect like, how the image is kind of maybe skill, skill a little bit or like if it's um, the not scale like horizontal and vertical the same, it will be uh, um, kind of like governed by the intrinsic parameters. And um, so for the extrinsic parameters, it will be simple. So basically, as we mentioned, like we may start with the camera coordinates, maybe here with this UVW here. Uh, it's kind of different from this uh, well coordinate here. And uh, I, I don't intend to draw this line here, but it just came out. So let me change the pointer again. Um, so first of all, I want to align that. So we want to uh, just probably transfer this origin of this uh, world coordinate, origin C to the uh, kind of the coordinate, oh sorry, not the world coordinate, the camera coordinate, uh, the origin of the camera coordinate C to the world coordinate. So we just translate C by basically minus C there. And then I, then we want to, okay, uh, translation will be simple like this way. Um, I tell you, I didn't specify that why this is translation. Uh, but it is. We can we can we can just try to weigh it down. So let's say if I have coordinate points say like x, y, z, one, right? This is the homogeneous homogeneous coordinate in the three D world, like with points say like, uh, at x, y, z, and x, y, z, and then if I multiply by this t here. Then what I get, what do I get? I will get the first number will be what? Okay, the last last number will be just one way because 
times zero times zero times zero x times zero y times zero c times zero times one uh, and sum all together will be just one here and then like the first row will be or actually the easy way to look at that would be just think of this thing uh, just one factor and this is an other vector so let's I call this let's say V so I have basically like V and 1 times so it's on the other side ah, let me write that uh, I minus C times V and 1 right and this will be just I times V minus C times 1 right so therefore it's just equal to V minus C right So therefore, it's just a translation by like uh, translated by C. So then rotation. Uh, I now I want to rotate the coordinate like of this camera to align with al align with the world coordinate. So I simply need to multiply by rotation matrix like this U V W and. Uh, you can again like just let's see uh, I'm thinking why is times u v w actually? Let, let's uh, I I am sure that if I write it down I can verify that. But I, um, let's see if I um. Let's just look at one. Oh okay 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 it makes sense okay makes sense. So what we want is that like we after so we have um. So if <coughs> actually, <this laughs> I'm thinking maybe it's incorrect, but uh, let's see. So let's say I have the original coordinate, uh, uh, original axis uh, is u, right? So I have a point there, uh, let's say pointing at u here. So after the rotation, it will get, oh yeah, yeah, I think it, it makes sense. So, um, so what I mean, I uh, originally, so this, this will be a rotation matrix. Um, so uh, it's a rotation matrix because, oh, that, that would be a long story, but, um, it is a rotation matrix because this is orthogonal. If you you realize that, right? Uh, any orthogonal matrix is either rotation or like refraction and stuff like that. So it, it's orthogonal because a uh, UVW is origin originally is perpendicular to each other. Right? So what, what I mean is orthogonal is like you, if you do a dot product of like U V, you get zero, V W get zero, U W get zero, and so on. And and it's also normalized because like all of them like it it have uh, unit norm, so we expect like this. These are the assets, right? Therefore, like we should have like uh, u u u transpose u is just equal to one, something like that. It's all normalized, and it's equal to v transpose v equal to w transpose w, something like that. And then, like if you start with a look at like uh, you along the u axis here, like you you have a point that they Let's say it's a like one zero zero, right? So this is the point right along this U axis. 
uh, after rotation, I want to it get into the um, uh, let's see. Oh, okay, I, I, I'm sorry. Actually, this this can be confusing. Um, I shouldn't write like this. So what I mean is, I let's say this uh, this uh, I mean this point here. Of course, like I, I can write one zero zero, but I need to maybe put a remark here. This is according to the coordinate of uvw in the uvw coordinate is one zero zero but in the x y c coordinate will be something else right it may be it's basically should be equal to this uh let's say uh I, maybe i call it like just uh what uh maybe i okay m let me call it like x x u y u and z u and z u so this is under the x, y, c coordinate. And this u, v, w, actually, this vector is, uh, when I write this u, v, w here, it's actually u is exactly equal to this. So I, I hope I'm not really confusing you guys. Is, is that OK? So this u, v, w here, I, I've written down here, are the values under the world coordinate. Of course, I, if I write it down as like the U V W coordinate will be just say one zero 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 one zero and zero zero one and so on, right? But this is under the world coordinate, so therefore, like the values should, should not be like identity matrix. Now they uh have some values are equal to this, and if I have I have another vector like is equal to this exactly this U here, or like equal to this U uh X U. Y U V uh Z U here, C U here, this is the U here. And and if I rotate this vector by this matrix, if I doing things right, I should get to let's say uh one C O C O, right? Because I want to rotate that to this world coordinate, right? So um, that's exactly it. Like so, if I rotate this by this R here, uh, that means that if I have, I'm sorry, let me write it here, R times U here, again, like U is in the world coordinate. R times U will be what? It will be something like U transpose U is just equal to one, right? And. Um, Uh, let me write it better. Uh, this is very painful. Like, like, okay, this is nice. So, I mean, um, again, like, I have R is equal to this U transpose, V transpose, W transpose times 1. Now, if I want to rotate a vector U, again, like, it should be in homogeneous coordinate. I should put a 1 here, right? So it's something like that, right? Now, if I rotate it, it will be just equal to um this look at this this is a matrix right this is a three by three matrix this is a three by one vector so i can write it as a u transpose v transpose w transpose times u plus one way uh, oh sorry um plus zero. So I mean this multiplied by this times zero multiplies by one, so therefore plus zero. And then I look at the row below will be like zero times u and plus one times one. So and then this should give me um one yeah one zero zero right and this one something like that so that's exactly what we want here just because i u v will be v transpose u is equal to zero w transpose u is equal to zero so so any question that that do i did i confuse more people
you, you next you, you seems like not convinced or something like that. So. Uh, do, uh, do, uh, did I confuse you guys with fear? Like, so um, be very careful that like, uh, you need to check the dimension of what I'm waiting. Like, you here is a feed by one vector, and this is all of feed by one vector, a and this is zero. Okay, this is one by three, so we need to be careful, and this is like one by one. So I, I mean like um. It's a little bit all work, but like if, um, yes, then then you can do the same thing by v and w. All of them, like for example, if I m multiply out by v one, I should get like c one c one, right? That's exactly what we want. It's actually we expect like we rotate this in the world code. I mean v after the rotation it will align with the y axis as anyway and then w after we rotate it will align with the c axis so okay that that's why we have this matrix here so yes i guess i would just and um so therefore like we, we basically will have um the projection if we first align that like uh align the points from the uh Kind of like the, the original, um, uh, when we align the camera coordinate to the world coordinate, as I mentioned, we'll just basically first multiply by a translation matrix and, and then a rotation matrix. And then we also have like further projection. Further projection now is like everything is in the world coordinate. So then we can just multiply by that projection matrix, right? And the projection matrix will, be, will just transform in three dimension to two dimensions. Um, afterward, we may have some intrinsic parameters that we are going to talk about that maybe uh, the, the, I mean, the camera is just not kind of like set up nicely, then it will have some intrinsic parameters. So, um, so this, again, like this is the, the intrinsic parameters, these are the rotation matrix and so on. Uh, and remember, like because I I have, uh, I have this multiplied by that, and you have, therefore this is equal to what L L I plus C O right, and Let, let me I don't have enough space actually um, uh, let me let me let me so after the multiplication I mean this multiplied by this times I plus this multiplied by this I get out right and then I let me erase that And then I have R multiplied by T plus zero multiplied by one. I, I have R T here. And then like below, I will basically have zero, zero there. I see, is that? Oh no, actually zero one here, right? And then like, I have the projection here. Right? After the projection, this guy multiplied by this guy here. This basically multiplied by I, zero, 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 right? Then I base uh no no actually sorry ah me this is getting really messy let me uh okay multiply by this guy this is actually equal to I C O something like that but this this is just an I right, basically so I C O I will just get back like L M L T right. And what is below is just gone, so that that's why we we have here it's just R M L T left, and we we may even call this out big L T as a small T there. And remember, we still have this uh, interesting uh, parameter matrix there. 
uh, and that is say phi by phi, something like. So that, that, that that's basically the whole model. So just um, we have this x here. Rt is actually pretty simple. It's just rotation and translation matrix. And k is this intrinsic parameters that uh, typically you can ignore. But I, I will just give a couple of slides to talk about them. For example, like let's say in a pretty ideal case, for example, low ski and also like um, and the uh, optical center is still still uh, unit aspect ratio. Then this um, kind of uh, projecting projection matrix is more or less it's just a diagonal matrix. And um, we, we can have some scaling a little bit, like you have this D here. If you even ignore the scaling, then we can just make it an identity matrix. Um, then afterward, let's say if I have some optical center that the image optical center is just different from your uh, optical center of that camera that project to that thing. Actually, I don't know why you want to do that because like, this is kind of artificial, right? If you really want to do that, you can just, again, like, as a transition there, so it's, it doesn't matter. And, uh, and another thing is like, maybe you, you're just not in scale. Well, I mean, like, may not have unit aspect ratio, like maybe in the horizontal axis, just somehow it's like fatter than the horizontal, fatter than vertical. Then you can add a parameter there also, kind of scale that. And finally, you may have some ski, uh, ski effect that is just like the image just scale a little bit, then, then uh, we'll have another parameter there. So uh, ultimately, you see that like this K matrix maximally, like you can have like five parameters. And now remember the whole matrix to start with, like we said like this, at most 11 parameters. Uh, it looks like we have more, a lot, right? We have R, it looks like the R matrix is, uh, the T matrix, okay, T, uh, let's, let's go back. We, we have we have this R and T, right? This looks like a lot of stuff here because this whole thing is three by four, right? So it looks like we have 12 parameters and we have like five parameters here. It doesn't add up quite right. But think of like for rotation and translation, it doesn't really have so much information there. Translation only have three degree of freedom, so right? you, you say like you translation that far away only. You you say uh, translation to there and to to what percent there? You just need three three kind of like scalar number, right? And then the rotation also like basically rotation. You just need to three dimensional angles, right? You say you, you first rotate. This axis like with alpha, that axis with beta, and that axis with gamma, that basically represents everything. So therefore, like it adds up correctly. So um, for intrinsic matrix, basically only have six degree of freedoms, and the intrinsic have five degree of freedom. So it exactly adds up to like eleven parameters. And um, so that that's uh, basically the entire thing now. That what we have for the camera model and uh, uh okay I, I I let me just one uh, kind of small demo maybe let's see if it works or not. Let's see. Ah uh, where did I put it? Hmm The lesson learned is not to move thing around before the lecture. I just simply remember, forgot where I moved that. So okay, maybe I'll show you that next time. I, I'm not going to show it now. So uh, let's let's just move on. So that um, the perspective matrix or like the camera model we, we just specified in 
uh, exactly take into account any uh, video dis distortion. So we, we can, I mean, we may have like video distortion in, in the camera also. Actually, it's very common, right? For example, if you have a fish lens appear there, then we, we have some some bell distortion or like we, we can also like this pinch cushion distortion as well. So um, we, 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 if we need to model that, we need to just simply get, put another linearity at the end of the projection, like after the whole camera models. So um, that's what we are going to do that. So let's say we have this, this is the coordinate that after all the projections that we had earlier, then if we need to do a conversion, we simply add a non-linear conversion like this. And um, out here is basically the radio distance from the center of the image. And, uh, and basically like that, then you just fit the parameter, right? like K1, K2, and so on. Um, and uh, that's, uh, okay, this, this is, okay, I, I, I don't need to really go for this animation here. So, um, so in terms of calibration, so as you can see, uh, that would be like two things. So one thing is like simply fitting this uh, whatever perspective matrix. This M here now is like the, the one we have earlier is with the K multiplied by with this uh, extrinsic parameters matrix there. Um, and, um, and then like we also may have the radio distortion that uh, we need to take care of. So, but if we ignore the radio uh, distortion, basically we, we just simply trying to fit um, data points. Like if we have some long data points, let's say we, we know what, what the 3D coordinates, what coordinate points there, and we know where are they in the image, then we can simply try to fit the projection matrix with these coordinates, right? So basically we just need lots of these points though. So uh, actually not too much because like, each of these, like each points here, we have more than one equation, right? Um, so we have, actually we have in practice, how many equations do we have? Let's see. So let's say we have just consider one, uh, one, one pair of like 3D coordinates and 2D coordinates. So we just elaborate that. And remember what are the unknown variables here. Sometimes we just get lost easily. These M's are all the unknown variables we want to fit uh, the data with. So then I, uh, basically we can write down three equations here, right? So, but be careful that like, S is like something, uh, it's a dummy variable, right? We, we don't care about the, the scaling of this factor here. So therefore like, actually, it's actually U and V is just equal to that. And then like, we can move things around, basically move this U, like this denominator up and this denominator up here. Now then we're just moving around, then we have, let's see, we have something like this, right? So therefore like each pair of coordinates, like if you know the 3D coordinates and the 2D coordinates, then you have two equations there. So how many variables again? Do you remember? Like, uh, more than that, like here, like we, yes. We, we, we look like we have 12, but actually we have 11 of them. So ideally like five points are sufficient, but typically we take more than that. Like we, we can overfit the data, it doesn't matter. So, um, so uh, and then, yeah, of course I've, if we overfit that, then we'll be, become a least square problem. So basically, um, uh, one way to deal with that, so basically, again, like we have many points here like on this side, many points on this side, and we generate a kind of like a, a, a kind of like, uh, what is that called? A, uh, okay, least square problem here. So um, the first method, okay, first approach will be basically, because I, this matrix is, um, is equivalent up to scaling, right? So we can arbitrarily, let's say, set this one to be one. Let's say we just constrain like M3, 4, it'd be just equal to one. So if we do that, and we have the 
uh, what we have the equations earlier. Uh, if we, we, we go for the algebra, we will have a kind of like a least square problem like this. So it will be like simply a, a form like x equal to b, right? So what was the solution for that? Like what was? Do you guys know? Like do you remember like what would be the least square solution for this one? So okay, first of all, if this is not a least square problem, let's say if A is actually uh, have the um, let's see. So what I mean is that if A is n by n and x is n n by one, I really hate this like kind of. Uh, so I need to go. So then, if if that's the case, and, and of course I assume A is full angle. Right? So then I guess I, you you can't remember like from linear algebra maybe like it's full angle, then this A can have an inverse matrix, right? Then simply I can just multiply by A inverse on both sides, right? Then therefore like X will be simply equal to A inverse multiplied by B, right? Yes. So now the, the, the thing is like, uh, we have more equation than needed, so than, than the alone. So therefore like basically we, we A actually have the size as a, A is a, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, m by n, where m is bigger than n, so it's like kind of a tall matrix here, and multiplied by x is, a, again, is m by 1. So then, of course, in this case, I cannot do the inverse, right, because it's not, like, uh, not a square matrix, there's, there's no inverse there. Uh, I'll just give you the solution there. Uh, so, um, I mean, in that case, amazingly, what you can do, like, and actually kind of intuitive is, th this is a, a tall matrix, right? So if I multiply this by A transpose, then this thing will become a square matrix, right? So I, I can multiply by A transpose on this side, and A transpose here, okay? So then, then I, I will have stuff, now I, I will have a, a transpose A, x is equal to a transpose b here. Now this, now this thing is now is a square matrix. Now I is a square matrix. Let's do the inverse for that. So if I do the inverse, um, then I multiply the inverse on both sides there. So then I will have like x is equal to a transpose a inverse a transpose b. Do you guys agree with that? No, you shouldn't, honestly. <laughs> I mean, like, this, this is cheating. I mean, like, there's no reason that this will actually be the solution or the best solution. It's just like, okay, let, let's try this. And then, put, I, I mean, like, um, so, uh, but it turns out this is the solution. Uh, this is the best solution. It's, it's like that. But you, you can actually prove that. I, I, I won't go through that. Like, I'll just, like, roughly show you, like, what is going on. So. Um, we try to find the minimum of that way, so uh, it's a least square approach way, so let's call this f, and then I, I basically, uh, then I can expand this thing into here, then you can actually take gradient, because I it's take gradient with respect to x here, then uh, uh, it turns out that like, you have two kind of terms here, right? you have basically x multiplied by a vector here, actually this is actually a vector, because this is a matrix, this is a vector, actually this multiple is a vector. And I also have this other formula, a vector multiplied by x, but both of them are scalar, actually they are the same thing, because I, this is actually also equal to x transpose multiplied by b transpose a transpose, something like that, they are, they are exactly the same thing there. Because you, you, you actually have a vector multiplied by x, I can write it as a x 
multiplied by the vector, and this vector is just a, the transpose of this vector, eh? transpose of that. And then you have another kind of like a, a square thing, basically like uh, x transpose times something times x. And if you take the derivative, try to take it derivative at home, then you get like this is equal to c plus c transpose c x, and you get this is equal to that. Then you can just substitute into that, then you get this. And then just like um, elementary calculus, the optimum will occur when the gradient is equal to zero, so therefore like, you just set this thing equal to zero, then you get like this is equal to zero, therefore like, the solution is this. Yes. Uh, as what we kind of like intuitive trying to move things around, it turns out it's the same solution. And uh, so therefore like, what, what we have again, like we can simply have x is equal to what a transpose a I forgot actually inverse uh, a transpose b something like that and it turns out in MATLAB this is actually this thing has a name for that this is called pseudo inverse and actually you can just simply MATLAB will be just one command they know exactly it's doing this so you just need to say okay I uh, it's like you are taking the um, kind of uh, what's that? You're taking the division on the right hand side, right? You have B here. I'm trying to take division on the right hand side with A, and that gives you the result there. Um, and this is one approach. The second approach, I guess I, I would just go for that. I guess I will finish that next time. So the second approach will be uh, we just don't care about like this. Don't. Uh, enforce this constraint, like scaling constraint at first, then we'll have like ax equal to c or something like that. But then the problem is that we cannot solve it directly because then, what, 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 why is that? Like, what's the problem like, if I just try to solve ax equal to c? What what happened if I just try to solve a x equal to zero here? I, I need to find some x satisfy a x equal to zero without adding any constraint. I, I have a trivial solution here. Eh? It's x is equal to zero. Eh? And, uh, and that trivial solution is not something I want. If I just put into some mathematical MATLAB or Python or uh, anything, it will give me just a trivial solution x equal to zero. And definitely, it's not something I want. So I need to impose constraint there. So I can impose a different constraint will be in this case, uh, assume x uh, has to be maybe let's say the norm has to be equal to one. So let's do that. So that means that it cannot be something zero. So if I impose something like that. And then, then um, again, uh, actually, uh, yeah, honestly, it's even a little bit, uh, okay, it doesn't matter. Let, let me go for this. So uh, th this is kind of nice to, nice to go for, um, um, because it's actually some use of your linear algebra. I don't know how many of you actually take in linear algebra before, and then you have questions that like, okay, what's the use for that? And the the use is here. This, this is our application here, like of linear algebra. So I try to uh, solve this, or I can be written as that way. Of course, I can be written as that because um, a x square is just equal to a x transpose times a x something like that. Then this transpose is like x transpose a transpose, right? Then I got that. And um, so now the, the trick here is like not obvious how to solve it, but I, I just say, uh, again, I, I, I should think I say I cheat, but I, I kind of know like what's, what kind of solution to expect, and I try to approach that way. So let, let's think of like the eigenvectors of like a transpose a. So and I, I, the eigenvectors, let's say, is a u1 up to un, and let's say I already sorted them. 
and then I, uh, with like increasing eigenvalues. And, uh, and I, I will just use this as basis. So um, some, some caveat and remark here is that like, I can know that I, I'm, I do not always able to do that. Uh, I can do that because like, A transpose A, A is a symmetric matrix. A transpose A is symmetric, therefore the eigenvectors are eigenvalues will be all real and also like the eigenvectors can be diagonalized. So therefore like these eigenvectors are actually can be form all orthogonal and also like uh, therefore I can form an orthogonal basis for that. So then I um, since it's an orthogonal basis then I can represent any x with this u right? So then like let's say I will just write x at this way. Right? And also like I want to pick C is equal to one. I mean, sorry, the sum of C is equal to one. Then if sum of C is equal to one, then you can easily see that like X, the norm of X would be equal to one, right? Because like, they, they, these are all basically like think of these uh, actually assets in the maybe 3D or something. You're just basically saying, uh, actually, this is a type. It's a uh, something. Maybe should C equal to one. Maybe C squared is equal to one. Something like that. This is like you kidding. This uh, is like a Pythagoras theorem, right? You're saying that uh, a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared and so on is the 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 hypotenuse, and that's basically the norm there. And the norm is equal to one. Yeah. So okay, this constraint is not in important. So I, but I say like ci squared is equal to one sum together. Now uh, then, if we do that, like this is satisfied. The the problem, the only question here is now what should I pick about this c one and c two up to c n with this constraint here? What what should I pick such that like this thing will be minimized? So let's look at that. So let's just substitute uh, our expression here into this one here. If we substitute that, then because uh, you are actual of uh, eigenvectors of a, right? So therefore, like a u is equal to lambda u, right? So if you you a apply into u here, you get a lambda here. Similarly, a transpose apply to u transpose here, you get a lambda here also. So then, like, U's are all of the way, so therefore, like, they only, they only UI multiplied by UI will be equal to 1. If you have UI multiplied by UJ, it will be equal to 0. Okay, I, it looks like I even make Joe loss. <laughs> is, that, is that any, any question? Right. I don't think so. Um, so, uh, okay, hopefully I didn't make Athens long. Um, because you, you have taken out the algebra, you said, at least you, you are the one supposed to. Okay, so therefore we eventually will get something like this. So then now, if I want to minimize that, and I have to constraint this way, and remember lambda are sorted. So then simple solution will be, I just pick C i is equal to one, and the uh, sorry c1 is equal to 1 and the west will be just equal to zero right? so then the, that will be the solution that basically like we should just pick a transpose a do the argon decomposition find find the argon value uh, so argon factors with the smallest argon value and that argon factor will be the solution yes so okay i guess i i, I probably should just stop here and we will come back like for more linear algebra. Um, no, actually, only a little bit more. <laughs>